Um, amongst a series of meditations on such topics as the inconveniences of obesity and the erotic properties of truffles, um, the great French food writer Jean Anthon Brillat Savarin found time in his 1825 uh, cookery masterpiece, uh, The Physiology de Goût, The Physiology of Taste, for one meditation of quite a different sort of kind. La fond du monde, the end of the world, is a subject, according to Brillat Savarin, that is so fascinating and so endlessly tempting to think about that everyone should give themselves some spare time to uh, evolve a detailed and personal fantasy of it. Uh, to that end, he recommends uh, a few questions to start you off. The end of the world. What happens during the first day of it, and the second, and so on, until the last one? What about the air, the earth, the waters on the earth, and the forming and mixing and exploding of all the gases? What happens to mankind according to age, sex, and strength or weakness? What about man's obedience to law, his submission to authority, his respect for other people and the property of his fellows? What does he do about trying to escape from the situation? And what happens to the ties of love, of friendship, and of kinship, of selfishness and devotion to others? What about religious sentiments, faith, resignation, hope, etc., etc.? Now, we don't get the answers, and we don't get the answers because, Brillet Savarin says, um, to give them out would be depriving us, the readers, of the fun of imaginatively playing around with it ourselves. Um, so this is fun we might reward ourselves with on um, some night where we can't get to sleep, he says, or in order to kill an idle moment uh, on a lazy afternoon. So the reason I start with this is because I think Brillet Savarin captures um, something of the strange doubleness of how we tend to think about the end of the world, culturally speaking. So as a subject, as you can see, it touches on questions of science, it touches on questions of how we tell stories about ourselves, it touches on questions of social organisation, and it touches on questions of religion. Um, yeah, equally, imagining it or writing about it is often codified as a rather facile and sort of jejune activity. Um, you know, sort of how we idiomatically talk about, you know, um, thinking about the meaning of life as something we do when we've not got anything more important to do. Um, it, it sort of it sees something, uh, kind of an unremarked central oddity to the fact that the end of the world as we know it as an imaginative subject in a way, the most absolutely serious of all the subjects, um, is most frequently encountered sort of by most people these days as part of a discourse of generically quite highly organised but often undemanding mass entertainment, so Hollywood disaster cinema, say, something whose conventions are enjoyably familiar, something that feels comforting in some ways, and are consumed when we've left our brain at the door. So what I think is interesting is that, in a sense, this has never been more important. The way we think about the end of the world, the way we imagine uh, apocalypse, the, the traps we might fall into and some of the questions that we ask around it um, are currently um, uh, kind of probably of more pressing importance uh, than they have ever been. There are people that know a lot more about cli-fi fiction, imaginations of the apocalypse now than I do, um, but it seems to me a very interesting uh, sort of moment to consider the role of escapism and our very difficult responses um, to the end of the world. Now, uh, the reason I talk about this in this context is that literary criticism and Victorian studies in general has generally asked quite a lot of questions about apocalypse. Uh, of the end of the world as a subject, it has asked fewer, significantly fewer questions. Um, uh, there's a few changes to that, but um, criticism in this area tends often most to start by placing the end of the world and the apocalypse in direct opposition to one another. That is to say, um, criticism begins by dutifully pointing out that the word apocalypse is not the painting of the end of the world. Um, it is instead drawn from the Greek for revelation, and it's a term with a complex and literary uh, and theological um, history. Um, there's various different ways in which people have sought to make um, apocalypse kind of intellectually respectable as a, literary, a tool of literary analysis. Frank Commode's work on na uh, narrative is probably the most famous. Also, um, narratives like M. H. Abraham's of early Romanticism and Victorianism that starts with kind of apocalyptic beliefs around the French Revolution and then reveals itself as something more worthwhile. Uh, and something more sophisticated. That is an epistemological or personal um, transformation. In those critical cases, though, the common thread, and it's, it's true of others as well, um, is that imagining the end of the world is really important, but intellectual and critical seriousness uh, is measured by how far one moves beyond it or by how far, far one can alchemize it into something else. So in that sense, with that curious doubleness um, continues. I uh, contend, and I think I'm, I'm, it's kind of the way I'm thinking about it more broadly, that the Victorians have quite a lot to talk to us uh, about this. Um, that they recognise powerfully that intimations of the end of the world are important in themselves, uh, particularly insofar as they reveal our kind of strangely contradictory reactions, our uncertainty about how to embody the scenario imaginatively, and actually the very simple problem of how seriously we should take it. Um, 
uh, perhaps more than we've recognised. So at least partly I think that's because uh, Victorian literature has uh, a very narrow uh, generic language of how to talk about uh, uh, apocalyptic fiction. Um, apocalyptic fiction hasn't yet quite organised itself uh, a genre to live in. And that sense that comes uh, in the Victorian period of not quite no knowing what to do with the subject and reacting to it a little strangely is actually very, very um, pronounced. So you find that in, uh, say, newspapers and so on, train crashes, uh, end of the world preachers, environmental concerns, industrial accidents, adverts for milking machines, uh, as well as fictional narratives, all start playing around with the idea about um, the end of the world. And there's, ex and there's anxiety, of course there is, that's almost the first thing we think of, but there's excitement as well. Uh, Wilkie Collins, for example, uh, relished the taste of apocalypse that even the name of Land's End conjured up uh, while visiting Cornwall in 1850. Land's End, it fills the minds of imaginative people with visions of barrenness and solitude, with dreams of some lonely promontory far away by itself out in the sea, just the sort of place where the last man in England will be most likely to be found, waiting for death at the end of the world. Um, there's also, uh, we find humour. Um, so the widespread satirical and comic use of end of the world tropes in the uh, Victorian era practically eats itself in one late article in the Daily News of 1892, which complains that satire is gradually laying waste to everything. It must come to this one day, as we near that end of the world already foreseen, wits, preying on wits, will be among the final great signs. These crucial hunters will have cleared the earth of all game but themselves, and funny man will chase funny man across the vast and cheerless plains. So it's with that rather less certain, slightly more playful uh, characterization of Victorian imaginings around the end of the world um, that I want to use the end of the world writing of Matthew Phipps, MP Scheel, and Arthur Conan Doyle at the turn of, century, turn of the century as standing symbolically, so to speak, for a twilight or, or an end point in that radical uncertainty, that radical playfulness that we find kind of in Victorian thinking about uh, the apocalypse. Of course, most people remember Conan Doyle, if they uh, remember M.P. Scheel at all, it's quite uh, unfortunate. Well, they remember them as early pioneers of modern uh, apocalyptic um, fiction. Um, I'm toying here with the idea that actually they might instead stand at the end of that specifically Victorian sense of the end of the world. In other words, they write uh, essentially at the moment, just before the kinds of tensions around the subject, the anxiety I've been talking about, become somewhat occluded by the apocalyptic genre becoming a kind of familiar part of the furniture in terms of literary and cultural organisation. Uh, a point where some of the difficulties that presented to the 19th century still register but are gradually reforming under the pressures of a hardening kind of generic expectation uh, around the end of, end of the world. So the career of Conan Doyle is, of course, phenomenally well known. Uh, the career of Matthew Phipps-Shiel is uh, less so. Entertainingly, that didn't him get, uh, stop Matthew Phipps-Shiel getting irritated by the comparison with Conan Doyle, which you'd have thought he'd be quite thankful for. Um, why do you insist on comparing me to Conan Doyle? He writes uh, rather preciously to his sister. Uh, Conan Doyle does not pretend to be a poet. I do. So the reason she probably made that um, apparently offensive comparison uh, was because in that year, um, Scheele published a volume called uh, Prince Zaleski. I don't know whether anyone's read that, but uh, the title character is a brilliant but kind of weird crime-solving Russian nobleman. Uh, he's probably the most decadent of the very many numbers of detectives that turn up after 1893 when Sherlock Holmes goes over the Reichenbach Falls. So essentially what, what he is is a kind of replacement Sherlock Holmes. Um, uh, in a pocket, so they have a kind of a, a sort of comparison in that sense. But actually, in apocalyptic matters, the two writers um, uh, are interestingly inverse. So Conan Doyle is obviously phenomenally well known, but his dealings with the apocalypse, with the idea of the end of the world, um, are almost entirely um, kind of unknown to people. Scheel is a much lesser known writer, but where he is known, his reputation rests almost entirely on uh, Zaleski and one end of the world novel uh, called The Purple Cloud um, of 1901, which would be probably familiar to many of you. Also, their respective directions of travel in relation to the subject of the end of the world are also inverse. 
So in a very early story called The Passman of Jackman Gulch, Conan Doyle um, joins quite a lot of Victorian writers um, in writing up a distrust of apocalyptic preachers, uh, this, this idea that apocalyptic preachers are somehow kind of charlatans. So he writes this story which is set in um, Australia where an apocalyptic prophet comes to town and everyone's enraptured and they go to his kind of sermons to sort of lull themselves into the end of the world. He turns out to be a bank robber who, while they're all listening to the sermon, all these accomplices go and rob the bank. So um, there's a kind of cynicism that starts. The end of the world is absolutely absolutely nowhere in Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes that, I, that I'm aware of. There is not even a kind of rhetorical gesture um, towards it. But later in life, things change. Um, Doyle becomes radically interested in it um, as part of his um, growing interest, famous interest in spiritualism. So in a novel he writes about the land uh, called The Land of Mist about spiritualism, he sees the idea of thinking that the end of the world is nigh as part of an economy, not necessarily a particularly respectable part of it, but part of an economy of kind of spiritualist thought. He, he sort of recognises there's a, there's, a kind of, um, there's a kind of relation there. Um, but also, um, just before he dies, um, he um, actually gave full reign to this um, idea of um, the coming uh, apocalypse. Um, so these thoughts um, are published in the Sunday Express. Apparently, he sent them uh, as part of a letter to another writer called S. Fowler Wright. Um, now, is this genuine, we ask? Well, um, the Doyle family sued uh, or took an action out against Wright for breach of copyright. So I think we can safely assume that they at least thought this was um, something genuine. Um, in Doyle's characterization, this is a crisis which could come as early as the following year and which will see the deaths of millions, but which will be quickly succeeded by a millennium of the spirit world, which will be broadly analogous to the second coming. So in its rhetoric, as well as in its prophecies, it resembles entirely the prophecies of early Victorian Christian preachers of the end times, like John Cumming and Michael Baxter, themselves figures that Victorian culture doesn't really know what to do with. Um, they're, they're not quite sure whether to sort of be scared, why they're paying attention, how to ironise them, et cetera, et cetera. Scheele um, is born in the West Indies, comes to London in 1885. Um, in contrast to Doyle, he seems, from the beginning of his literary career, soaked in apocalyptic. He seems like he's um, kind of uh, very interested in it. Uh, Prince Zaleski even has, has a couple of moments. He becomes um, kind of first famous, really, for a kind of slightly appalling novel called The Yellow Danger, uh, which is a kind of apocalyptic fear of Chinese invasion. So it's the end of the world as the West knows it, um, basically. And then he follows it up with three novels, which all play to various degrees on apocalyptic themes. The Purple Cloud is by far the most successful and the most engaged with the subject of the end of the world. But after that, after The Purple Cloud in 1901, um, he'd, like Doyle, he continues to write and write, uh, but actually he pretty much dumps the theme. He, he revises The Purple Cloud in 1929, but really he kind of um, uh, leaves it behind. So what you have there is two very kind of oppositional sounding sort of careers in relation to that topic. So I know um, some of you will have read The Purple Cloud and be aware of it, um, insane. Um, it's a novel is simultaneously highly serious and highly playful uh, about the end of the world and intensely interested in the nature and the variety of our reactions to it being raised as a subject. So after a polar expedition goes disastrously wrong, the narrator Adam Jeffson ends up at the pole itself. Um, famously and rather quaintly, um, Scheele believes that the pole is in fact an actual pole. Um, so he gets there and goes, look at, look at that. Um, uh, so uh, Adam Jeffson gets there. But when he gets there, he releases a cloud of poison gas onto the world, which wipes out every living being uh, in, the, in the world except himself. So the trappings of what start with this polar expedition of a very, very Ryder Haggerish kind of populist adventure story drop startlingly away. And Adam, as the last man, seemingly goes mad with a kind of serio-comic manic depression uh, that ensues. I watch my mind, as in the old days, I would watch a new precipitate in a test tube to see what sentiment it would settle. I am very averse to trouble of any sort, so that the necessity for the simplest manual operations will rouse me to indignation. But if a thing will contribute largely to my ever-growing voluptuousness, I will undergo a considerable amount of labour to accomplish it, though without steady effort, being liable to side winds and whims and purposeless relaxations. It's, it's kind of all written in this style. It's, it's a very odd um, kind of way of uh, writing. This lethargy passes, and Adam then decides to travel the world and burn down the traces of all previous civilization. Uh, this is an incendiary project which occupies a good portion of this novel. Um, so he just goes to Venice and thinks, right, where's the petrol? So let's, let's get rid of that, so on and so on. 
All the time as well, Scheel weaves through it this kind of weird, haunting Manichaean theology of black powers battling with the white for the future of humanity. And in the sense, I think, one gets one sense of the awkwardness there of where the theological pattern is meant to fit into this kind of, um, uh, this kind of um, uh, apocalyptic um, retelling, this kind of secular apocalypse. There's also a sense in which I think the structure of the novel, this is probably going out a little bit further, offers a sly commentary on that critical tendency to think about the end of the world um, as something you start off with and then gets alchemized into something more serious, more psychological, uh, more narratively. As the end of the world stubbornly refuses to go away, there is a transformation in Adam, but it's into selfishness, decadence, and madness. This isn't sort of, you know, words with on the Simplon Pass. But more importantly, the question Shield begs here feels structurally very similar to that first list um, Brulé Savram puts out. Uh, the kind of almost the parlour game sort of aspect of the end of the world. You know, if you were wiped out by a, and the, the only man in humanity and were left alone, what would you do? Obviously, burn cities down. How would you live? Well, you'd live like a decadent potentate. How would you project meaning into your existence? Uncertain. How would you feel on discovering another survivor, as the narrator eventually does? At the end of that is crowded, um, as by then sharing a space as small as a planet feels absolutely intolerable. The questions are entertaining, they're almost comfortingly so, but the answers are so strange and extreme that they destabilise the parlour game aspect of imagining the end of the world, draw us into thinking about the psychological pressures of the end of the world, and, I would argue, almost make that novel appear genre-busting before the genre it is starting has actually appeared. So West Shield's text is absolutely confrontational in the way it does justice um, to that destabilising nature of the story of the end of the world. Um, Doyle does something slightly different, so almost halfway between the sort of heyday of the rationalist Sherlock Holmes and that sort of rather startling spiritualist apocalypse uh, letter uh, just before he dies, um, he writes a story which I think seems to mark that transition from that Victorian kind of interest in the apocalypse to the modern in a slightly different way. Um, many of you will know this as well, The Poison Belt which is published very late, actually, in relation to the Victorians. It's published in 1913, and it does feel very much like it belongs there. It's the second of the stories to feature Professor Challenger. Um, if you don't know him, he's a sort of Brian Blessed type who, who combines physical strength with a quick temper and a loud voice. Um, uh, the parlour game aspect of the end of the world, that idea of enjoying it, of, kind of, of, of sort of using it as a kind of uh, entertainment, is, is much accentuated in this story because most of it is set in a parlour. Um, so most of this story is set in the house um, owned by um, Professor Challenger, uh, which is furnished in a very, very Edwardian, uh, Victorian Edwardian style. It's all heavy mahogany desks, delicate vases, and a fine view of the train line from London to Brighton. Through, by the way, an enormous bow window, a window which seems to act in the novel as a uh, sort of half painting, half cinema. It's very pregnant, um, kind of in that way. What the Poison Belt's characters are gathered in this house to observe is, of course, the end of the world. So Challenger has worked out that the Earth is about to pass through a poisonous belt of ether. Um, like Scheel, um, Doyle bases his end of the world narrative on the idea, um, the, the notion that universal ether is the element through which light travels. Um, this is pretty much a dead duck in science by about the 1880s. So in a sense, it, even, it carries on that idea that this is kind of, feels like a kind of end of the era um, point. So what is going to happen as it passes through that belt is the annihilation of the planet by asphyxiation. So Challenger has uh, thus invited some specially chosen friends and colleagues to come and watch the oncoming disaster, almost in the spirit of a dinner party. Uh, indeed, they actually do have dinner. Um, so Brillé Severin's idea of the end of the world as a kind of after-dinner entertainment is entirely literalised when the characters ask Challenger what he proposes to do, and he replies, take lunch. Uh, a meal which subsequently the narrator surprisingly describes as very merry. Life, death, fate, the destiny of man, these were the stupendous subjects of that memorable hour, made vital by the fact that as the meal progressed, strange sudden exultations in my mind and tinglings in my limbs proclaimed that the invisible tide of death was slowly and gently rising around us. So that's the effect of the ether as they eat the meal and sort of have a jolly time talking about it. The, uh, bizarrely, the heavy furnishings play their part as well. Uh, one character darkly considers the moment when, quote, we should lie gasping upon that cherry-coloured boudoir carpet. Indeed, Doyle has a lot of near kind of Wildean fun with the subject. He's constantly making jokes at the situation's expense, which jar totally with the apparent sense of tragedy. 
Uh, this is, uh, you know, written with so much in wild in mind, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm expecting the end of the world today, Austin. Yes, sir, what time? I can't say, Austin, before evening. Very good, sir. Now, Challenger's plan is to hermetically seal the house with varnished paper and arm them all with oxygen cylinders. It won't save them, but it may, quote, give us some hours, possibly even some days, on which we may look out upon the blasted world. And as the disaster comes in, and this is the sort of image I want to finish on, the characters draw uh, to watch the apocalypse unfold. Extraordinary moment, I think. We drew four chairs up to the long, long window, low window. The lady still resting with closed eyes upon the settee, that's Mrs. Challenger. I remember that the monstrous and grotesque idea crossed my mind, the illusion may have been heightened by the heavy stuffiness of the air which we were breathing, that we were in four front seats of the stalls at the last act of the drama of the world. The po Poison Belt is a very curiously, self-consciously distant and passive narrative. And through that window, through that big Victorian bow window, they watch some of the Victorian intimations of the end of the world. They see train crashes. They see the distant destruction of cities. They even see people dying as they're trying to play golf. Hemmed in and surrounded by all these kind of Victorian things, all these Victorian trappings, a pair of scientists, an aristocrat, and a dutiful wife, they seem somehow to be, to me, the last survivors, not only of the human race, but representatives of a time that is over. Uh, Mrs. Challenger actually sees it in exactly those points. Eventually, of course, the nature of the genre means that they venture out, they smash the window as they go, and everything's fine. It turns out nobody's dead, it's just temporary catalepsy. Um, but that central image of the figures comfortably watching at the window is a very powerful one. Almost, dare I say, it's a bit grandiloquent, but the last Victorians kind of out of their time. The difficulties of participation, the uncertainties around the end of the world, the playfulness, um, have been, you know, they're not doing that anymore. They're watching it from a safe distance. You're not experiencing the apocalypse as epistemic difficulty or discursive awkwardness, but as a sealed off spectacle, kind of neatly framed. So for me, Doyle's text is playfully and generically uncertain enough to belong to that tradition of 19th century end of the world writing. Um, but I think we also, to some extent, see the sun setting on that approach here and rising on a modern, more generically organised, possibly safer form. Um, a little bit of the Victorian literary past held in stasis, looking at the future of imagining the end of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>